we're now joined by Commander Scott Kelly, who is the author of the wonderful new children's book, Good Night Astronaut. Scott Kelly, welcome to the Clam Pod. Thanks for having me. Such a both incredible story. You've got such an incredible story. Uh, and as well, great design of the book. You picked a really good illustrator to collaborate with. I really loved, uh, as just a fan of the visual arts, it was uh, absolutely exceptional. So congratulations on, on the new book. You know, this book is about dreaming and exploration. And you're obviously well known for being, you know, a, a, an astronaut and spending a year in space. But this book showcases so many of the adventures that you've been on. What were you hoping kids will will take from this book well i i hope that kids uh you know read the book and imagine what type of things that they'll be able to do in their lives and hopefully it'll inspire them i personally was inspired by a book myself um and it's uh you know each little story is about places that i've slept so you know what better way to write a bedtime story than to tell kids about a bunch of cool places I've slept in my life and hopefully that'll uh, help them go to sleep. And you've obviously done different types of books in the last several years. You wrote a memoir, published your photography. What appeals to you about doing children's books? Well, they're certainly a lot easier than the ones with more words. <laughs> <laughs> I think my book Endurance probably, I don't know, had 130,000 words and I I probably wrote 200,000 words. This one here, I don't know, maybe it has a thousand words. I don't even know. It's not many, but it's perfect for kids ages three to seven for their parents to either read to them or for them to start learning how to read themselves. So yeah, it's a lot easier. Um, it's kind of, you know, writing a, a, a memoir, your autobiography is probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Whereas this is more, fun. So that's kind of what I like about it. Absolutely. So, you know, the the first part of your book, we really have to talk about, it documents your life growing up with your twin brother, Mark. And this is very important to us because we are brothers as hosts of this podcast. So very much resonates with us. Uh, what were you and Mark like as kids? You know, we were uh, pretty rambunctious and hyperactive and I wouldn't say juvenile delinquents, but that was always, you know, we were maybe bordering on that a little bit at times. Um, yeah, we were a handful for my uh, my parents and, you know, climbing things, jumping off things, breaking things. Uh, it, uh, yeah, I don't know how my mom did it. Well, I love the part where you talk about you and Mark basically trading time off in space. I, I can imagine it's quite the sensation when you take your own space, you take your own space flight. But what was it like watching your brother go into space? Well, uh, it was real cool. I, and I flew in space before he did. And uh, I never missed the opportunity to point that out, <laughs> that I flew in space first. I flew in space last. I flew in space longest. So he had to go and become a U.S. senator, I guess. So uh, um so, uh, yeah, I flew like two years before him. So it was really cool to uh, see him uh, launch on his first flight. And I remember, you know, I tried to explain to him what the first like eight and a half minutes of a space shuttle mission, the, the launch was going to be like, um, you know, and he had the same training as I did, the same experiences. Actually, you know, he was a little bit more experienced in doing some, you know, kind of crazy things in that he flew in combat during the first Gulf War. And I didn't do that, but uh when he got back right when the shuttle landed and they opened the hatch, I was standing right outside. And, uh, as soon as he came out, the first thing he said to me was, I had no idea what that launch was going to be like. I mean, it is just that crazy. And, uh, yeah, so it was always cool seeing him, uh, get the fly. And, uh, I would imagine he feels the same way. Were you guys pretty competitive growing up? Not really. I mean, not with each other. We, we kind of joke about it a little bit, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we were competitive, I think a little bit by nature, but not between each other. It wasn't like we were always trying to one up each other or anything. When did you guys start talking about being astronauts? Well, I never really considered it because I was uh, such a bad student, uh, growing up, uh, couldn't pay attention, didn't do my homework. Um, graduated in the bottom half of my high school class, just barely, 
not proud of that, but uh, I eventually found a book myself that inspired me when I was in college, and that was Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff. And, uh, you know, was Tom's writing style, perhaps, you know, this kind of creative nonfiction got my attention uh, and kept my uh, attention. And he made me feel like I had things in common with the guys in the book. There were guys at the time, not anymore, but the you know, the guys that be, were the original, like uh, Mercury 7 and Gemini and Apollo astronauts. And I thought, you know, if I could just fix uh, one thing about myself, um, you know, I think I had the other kind of characteristics to make a, make a go at it. So I just, you know, buckled down and learned how to study and become, you know, kind of just brute force method my way through it. And eventually I started doing better and, you know, got commissioned in the Navy. You know, it was when people look at, you know, 18 year old kid re reads book, decides he or she's going to become an astronaut. That seems like a, a giant leap, but you know, in, in retrospect, you know, geez, uh, 30, almost 40 years later. Wow. Um, it was a bunch of much smaller manageable steps, just one built upon the other. We talk about a lot of those steps in the book in good night astronaut, um, I had no idea until I read the book that you had been to Mount Everest. What was what was that like? Well, I was at Mount Everest base camp. It's much ah. different. I did not <laughs> climb Mount Everest. Uh, I would like to, but I don't wouldn't like to uh, that much. So I probably never will. But uh, I was able to visit the base camp on the Chinese side, um, which is different than on the uh, Naples side because. Naples side, you have to walk there, a uh, trek. And uh, I would have done that. I would have actually preferred it in many ways. I just didn't have the time. And we had uh, a little bit of time to go to um, Tibet. I always wanted to visit Tibet. And on the Tibetan side, I guess theoretically you can walk, but you can also drive in a minivan, which in some ways is, makes it harder because you're, the acclimatization is tough when you're doing it all in like two days versus a, you know, a week long walk. So obviously this being the climate pod, we care a great deal about climate change. And we were super, super excited to read the book that you're a scuba diver, because that was one of the ways Ty and I both got into, uh, you know, established our first earliest connections to environmentalism. We were very fortunate. Our parents encouraged us to get certified as scuba divers at a young age. And that was, that was really fun. And I'll never forget Ty and I took a trip to the great barrier reef in 2008 and we saw both, you know, the rich coral life, but also the bleaching that was already happening. It was kind of, you know, one of the ways we were first face to face of what climate change was actually doing to the earth. You know, you chronicle some of these adventures in the book. What have you gained exploring life underwater? Well, yeah, that's you, you definitely see the, the bleaching and, uh, you know, I. I was in, uh, in, and the pollution in the oceans is just shocking. I was in ba Bali uh, a few years ago. Now, granted, I think part of this has to do with the tsunamis that were there, you know, just dragging garbage into the, into the ocean. But I was kind of shocked at just how, you know, much stuff was in, in the water and um, yeah. And the coral reefs, I mean, that's part of the whole, you know, very important part of the whole ocean ecosystem. And we're, kind of on the trajectory that, you know, is not good with regards to the, the health of those reefs, which has a, you know, effect on all kinds of marine life. So I'm not going to space, but I have been underwater. So I, I once went scuba diving with an astronaut and he said that exploring the ocean was in the, in the weightlessness that you feel was the closest he ever got to space travel on earth. I have a bias to believe this is true because I'm never going to space. Is this true? Who was the person you were with? His first name was Claude. I, I, in the dive book, I cannot figure out his oh, last Claude, name. Was it Claude Nicolier? Probably. It may have been. Swiss guy? I'm pretty sure, yes. This is in, yeah. 19, this is in 2000. Where were you? In uh, Cozumel. Yeah. I flew in space with Claude. He's an awesome guy. My first <laughs> space flight. He's, he's an astronaut. Yeah. Um, really sharp. Smart guy, too. Um, but uh, is it, you know, it's the closest you can to, uh, you know, being neutrally buoyant. The difference is in space, uh, you know, not only are you floating, 
but your blood is floating, all the fluid inside you is floating, your organs are floating. So it's a different sensation because of that. You get this fluid rush to your head. Also, the difference in water is that when you like move around in water, you translate, right? You have to overcome the friction with the water to get moving. So it takes extra force. But to stop, that friction is going to help you stop. In space, it's the exact opposite. So with no, you know, the air doesn't provide any friction and, and with no water, it's easier to get yourself moving in a, in a direction or, you know, especially like if you're in a spacesuit doing an EVA, but then because you don't have the water to, and the friction when you're trying to stop, it's harder to stop yourself. So that's the real uh, main differences. And, uh, you know, of course, you're not wet, except maybe if you're sweating. <laughs> We're not going to, we can't really compare ourselves to astronauts, but, uh, you know, I have to say that's a, the only cool thing we've, that's the only cool experience we've been on. <laughs> you can, I don't care if you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, did space exploration change the way you thought about the planet or especially climate change? Um, yeah, I, it, I think it, people and myself included, you know, there are a few, uh, you know, perspective changes I think you get on, uh, on the planet and humanity. You know, first of all, you see how beautiful Earth is from space. I mean, it's just incredibly blue and inviting looking, peaceful looking, I would say, um, you see how thin and fragile the atmosphere is. It's almost like a thin film over the surface of the earth. Uh, I describe it as like a contact lens over somebody's eye. And, uh, you know, when you're in an airplane, most of the atmosphere is below you. So it's not that thick. Uh, the other thing you notice from space is that uh, certain parts of the, uh, the planet are almost always covered in pollution, like in, uh, you know, China and Central America, India. Uh, but also you realize, or at least some people realize, I realize that, uh, you know, the United States is the number two per, uh, polluter in the, in the world. It's just not the kind that you see very easily with your, with your eye. It's not, you know, from burning, uh, wood and coal. Um, it's from other things. So it's not as easily visible. Um, you notice the rain, I, you know, I flew my first flight in 1999, my, my uh, last in 2016, and I could tell the difference between the rainforest in South America, uh, less forest, uh, more cleared uh, or burning fields. Um, you know, sometimes I would see storms that didn't seem to be where they should be, you know, a lot of fires on the planet. Uh, can you see climate change? I don't know if you can see it from space, but you could certainly see some of the effects maybe. Um, like, uh, yeah, I remember one time I was flying through the US lab module and uh, I happened to just glance out the window on the floor and I saw this big white thing with my naked eye. And it was in the, uh, in the summertime, I mean, it was in the winter in uh, the Southern hemisphere. So, and it turned, and then I got some binoculars. It was just this massive iceberg. I mean, to be able to see that from 250 miles away, I mean, it had to be the size of like, I don't know, Rhode Island or something. Um, and then the other thing you see is you don't see political borders um, during the daytime. At night, you can in some cases because countries use different kinds of light bulbs, but uh, you don't see political borders. And it gives you the sense that, you know, we're all part of, uh, you know, uh, team earth, um, all part of humanity sharing this planet. And, you know, the way we do challenging, difficult things is by working together. So it gives you a sense, I think, uh, you know, in some ways I think it made me a little bit more of a humanitarian. Yeah. I mean, having the perspective that you've had and being able to see, you know, the earth uh, as beautiful as you describe it, I mean, how does it make you feel when you do see that pollution or you do, you know, you watching the trends of the, of the earth warming and the climate changing over the last 50 years? Yeah, it's heartbreaking. I mean, imagine what this planet must have been like, like, you know, 200 years ago, 300 years, imagine a thousand years ago. And then, you know, all the way back to the beginning of the, uh, you know, human civilization, which is goes back like 200,000 years. I mean, 
imagine just what this plant, I mean, how beautiful and pristine this place was. And it's really, you know, just this, you know, since the industrial revolution, I guess that we really did some, you know, really messed it up, you know, some significant damage. It's just heartbreaking. And hopefully now my hope is that someday, um, you know, it took us, you know, 100, 200 years to get us where we're at. And it's probably going to take a lot longer to put it back where it was. But I, I, I like to hope and think that someday, um, you know, the earth will be a lot more like it was uh, before we mucked it up. Well, so what it is, what's so cool about Good Night Astronaut is you're really taking your career and your experiences and it's inspiring kids. I mean, I think it's so cool. Again, I love the book. What did you love the most about space travel? Um, so there's a lot of great things about it, right? It's, um, you know, the launch, the landing, the floating around in zero gravity, even though you know, it makes most things harder. It's kind of fun. A little, unco it's uncomfortable, you know, for a year with your head swollen. <laughs> but um, the thing I liked the most about it was that it was really, really challenging. It was a challenging thing to live and work in space and operate the spacecraft and the systems on the space station and uh, the experiments, the, you know, when you're on the space station, particularly, you have to do every job. I mean, you're not only you know, the scientist or the science, uh, science operator or the engineer or the commander, you're the, uh, you know, the plumber, the electrician, the IT person, the doctor, the dentist, all those things. So, um, you know, you can't call for help. If something goes wrong, you just got to deal with it. And the consequences of your poor performance could be, you know, the most significant consequence at all. And that is you get killed um, or your crewmates or you do something to, you know, destroy a hundred billion dollar space station. So, you know, that kind of uh, consequences and the required uh, focus and attention to detail and uh, work that it took was to me the most rewarding part of it. Um, the part I liked the most, uh, what I missed the most. And I also miss the people that I was in space with, even though um, none of them are in space right now. Sometimes, I can't say that because some of the cosmonauts, uh, you know, some of the folks I've flown in space with may fly again. But uh, yeah, I miss uh, that level of, of teamwork and cohesiveness of, uh, of a group. We talk about that incredible responsibility do you have. And, but you, you talk about this in, in such very calm terms. Was there any aspect of space exploration, whether it was launch or landing, that was, was the most nerve wracking for you? You know, certainly launching is, you know, that when you're um, part of a controlled explosion, especially on the space shuttle, you know, that has uh, 7 million pounds of thrust. And uh, once you light it, once those solid rocket motors light, there ain't nothing you can do about it. I mean, you can't turn them off. You can't throttle them. They're going to burn out. It's uh, kind of like being an insect on a bottle rocket and uh, you're just kind of along for the ride. So uh, you know, that and landing, you know, landing the space shuttle, having to be the guy on the controls is a little bit nerve wracking. It's also a lot of fun. Uh, you know, doing a spacewalk is physically and uh, mentally challenging. Uh, so a little nerve wracking there. But uh, yeah, I, but I do it all again in a second if I had the opportunity. Is there anything people often get wrong about space exploration? Um, yeah, some people. Some people get all kinds of stuff wrong. Some people think the earth is flat, which is pretty wrong. Kind of crazy, actually. Uh, I generally don't even give those people the time of day, but because uh, even though it's kind of, I think some of them, it's just kind of a big joke. But, uh, you know, if you're, you're, if you're able to believe something like that, you'll believe any kind of, you know, fake news or science things or crazy conspiracy theories. So, uh, um, but, you know, sometimes people think like, will ask me, uh, you know, when was the last time I was on the moon, which is a little bit, I don't know, misinformed, I guess, to not realize that uh, I had a Congress person ask me one time where the space shuttle lands on the moon. It was a long time ago. 
person's no longer in Congress, but I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the parking spot, right? <laughs> yeah. There's an airport up there. <laughs> Well, you were the commander of the International Space Station. What was it like working with people all over the world to complete your mission? It's great. You know, uh, very diverse group. Um, and I came from the U.S. Navy when I was there at the time. It's not like this anymore, I'm sure. But basically, it was a bunch of white guys flying airplanes. And, uh, you know, coming to NASA and seeing, uh, you know, people you know, a diverse group of Americans, but also, you know, people from other countries, uh, people that are born in different places, different educational systems, uh, different cultures. It, uh, you know, gives you a team with people with different perspectives. Usually when all the people are kind of the same, they kind of have similar perspectives and similar like solutions to problems. And they think, you know, the, you know, they kind of are mostly agreeable on what's important, what's not important. But I always found that NASA, that a, a diverse group is much more uh, stronger and a powerful team. Also pretty interesting flying with the Russians. I mean, they're great people. Personally, I, uh, you know, so some of my best friends are Russians. Um, uh, people wonder sometimes, you know, if our you know, earthly politics, international relations between the United States and Russia affects our relationships uh, as crewmates and absolutely not. Um, you know, because what was most important to us was, you know, supporting each other, you know, emotionally, uh, supporting each other in our work, relying on one another, literally, literally in some cases for our lives, if it, you know, came down to it, uh, that, you know, any kind of disagreements between our countries really it's almost like you were talking about two other countries, like, you know, China and Germany versus the United States and Russia, if there was something weird going on at, at the time. Well, the International Space Station program has just been this incredibly successful model for international cooperation. You know, are there learnings that people in the climate fight could take that are trying to get greater international cooperation uh, to combat the climate crisis? Well, it kind of shows you what kind of uh, challenging, complex things you can do if you work together in a cooperative way and in, uh, you know, international environment where you spread the, the work and the cost out is, uh, you know, is, is helpful, uh, certainly. Um, I think the space station is, uh, you know, one of the greatest examples ever of international cooperation. So much so that I think it should, and it has been nominated, but I think it should win at some point the Nobel Peace Prize because, uh, you know, I think it's been that successful and is that important. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, one thing, you know, people that are concerned with the climate can realize is that we need to work together, which what, uh, you know, the Paris Climate Accords was attempting to do. And I'm happy to see that we're uh, going to, you know, re-engage with the international community on climate issues, because that's the only way we're going to solve this problem. Well, yeah, here in the United States, the space, NASA and the space program for, for so long has captured the imagination of Americans. And it's really driven the spirit of what you can do with great innovation. And when you really challenge yourself to, to accomplish great things. And it's, you know, we're, as we, as we confront the climate crisis, we're thinking more and more is how, how can you rally that same spirit that we had, you know, for space exploration and really capture people's imagination that way. And I know you talk to, you give a lot of talk about, about leadership and endurance. How do you think the United States can better rally that spirit we, we've had to, to fight the climate crisis? You know, I think we need to continuously, you know, push back on the people that don't believe in science and uh, you know, try to get them on board with, you know, science isn't about, you know, what you believe. It's about, you know, having, you know, collecting data, analyzing the data, have it peer reviewed, come to a conclusion. It's not really subject to a debate once it's, I mean, it's always evolving, but, you know, you get, uh, you know, the the, the smart people involved and, uh, you know, the experts to come to conclusions, then, you know, that's what we should consider reality rather than, 
you know, you have all these people around this country saying, well, I don't believe in that. And you're like, well, why don't you believe in that? And they're like, well, I don't know. I just don't believe it, which is what kind of argument is that? It's ridiculous. So, um, yeah, I just wish we would have more people believing in science, getting their information from the experts. And, you know, I think that's what it's going to take. And then, you know, and then hopefully those people will elect, you know, their representatives that are also science minded people, because, you know, you're going to take, it's going to take, you know, their government to, to take the actions to do something. You know, I'm optimistic that, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, at some point, you know, all get together in agreement that this is something that we have to take seriously. And, uh, you know, you know, the earth is going to be fine. You know, so, you know, once we're the earth might decide, Hey, I'm tired of you people. And then <laughs> we'll go extinct and the earth will recover. Right. It's just us. That's going to have the issue. So I, uh, I hope we uh, start taking this more seriously. And it seems like we are. Well, yeah. And that's what gives me optimism. You have an administration that's taking it more seriously, as you mentioned, back in Paris. And we have new members of Congress, including including your brother, who are taking this very seriously. You mentioned being optimistic. What makes you optimistic? I just think the human spirit is, uh, you know, we're, as far as we know, the most, uh, you know, the smartest, most developed species ever. So, and we've done some incredible things. I mean, if you consider, you know, we first flew an airplane in 1903 and then, you know, I don't know, 96 years later, I'm launching on a rocket into space. I mean, we have some pretty amazing uh, capabilities if we put our mind together and minds together and, and work on things as, as a team. So. Well, it's this, uh, and I, I need to talk about dealing with setbacks and having endurance in a long fight. And obviously, a lot of people in the climate movement feel that way. This is a long fight. This is going to be, as you mentioned, it's going to take years, centuries to get back to where we need to be. What would your advice be to some of those climate advocate, advocates who are trying to combat the climate crisis? Well, you, you know, you can't give up and uh, this is going to take a long time. It's going to take longer than, you know, the remainder of your life or your children's lives. I mean, this is going to have to be a long term effort. It took us, you know, a few hundred years to get here and uh, it's not going to be solved overnight. But if we do nothing, um, we're in for some serious problems here, not in the not too distant future. Well, we, we're fortunate to not have to deal with flat earthers in the climate movement. It's not really a thing that's talked about, but climate doomers are really a thing. You know, people who aren't necessarily looking at climate science and just thinking, gosh, we're, we're just doomed. We can't do anything. It's not worth doing anything. And that is not true. Um, some of those people might advocate that we need to leave planet Earth. Um, what do you make of that conversation? People saying we just need to abandon planet Earth. Where are you going to go? To Mars? I mean, I think we should go to Mars, but not because we've ruined Earth. And what makes you think you wouldn't then ruin Mars? <laughs> right? But no matter, you know, how bad this planet is, it will always be easier to live here than it would be to move somewhere else. And that's the only place we could move. It's not like we're going to go to any, you know, near Earth-like planet in some other solar system. I mean, the closest one is like, you know, would take like 80,000 years to get there with their current technology. The people that arrived would be a different species than the people that left. So like, what is the real point then? So no, we need to take care of this planet. What's next for you? I mean, you've done so much in your career. Uh, is there, do you have interests in politics like, uh, like your brother, Mark? Um, you know, I, maybe a little bit, but let me, let's just see how he does, what he thinks of it, how he likes it. I don't know. It's, uh, it seems really hard. I mean, you have to, uh, to see what he went through to get elected. I mean, you have to raise money. You have to campaign. I mean, who, who raises money to get a job? Like you have to raise, he, I think he raised like almost a hundred million dollars to get this job that, you know, you represent these people from a state that you love and you want to represent all of them, you know, a good, a good, a good number of them probably hate you, 
even though you're working for them and trying to do the best thing you possibly can for them, because uh, we're so polarized in this country, you don't make a whole lot of money. You got to have two houses, uh, depending on what state you're from. I mean, it's just not, uh, it's a tough thing. I mean, you're, you got to do it for, you got to make sure you're doing it for the absolute right reason. And uh, he, he definitely is. I mean, uh, I know that. And I think he'll do a great job. I would never rule it out, but you know, I like to be able to just maybe live vicariously through my brother for a while and, uh, and uh, you know, be as, and support him as much as I can. Certainly. Um, as far as like other things, I, I do a lot of different things. I do some, you know, public speaking, you know, some book writing. I'm on some company boards. I help with some, uh, you know, aerospace companies do a little bit of consulting. I, uh, I kind of thought when I left NASA, I would have a lot less uh, work to do. As it turns out, that was not the case. So even though I have a bunch of part-time jobs, they seem to, you know, combined are more than a regular full-time job. Ty, I think that's the wrong question, whether or not he's going to run for office. Because if, if Ty got elected to the Senate, I wouldn't be thinking whether or not I'm going to run for office. I'm thinking, should I primary Ty? That'd be my first thought. <laughs> do you guys live in the same state? Yeah. We do. All right. Yeah, see, I don't live in Arizona, so. <laughs> yeah, primary. But that would it, it would make for a good debate, you know. Yeah. I, I confuse a moderator. <laughs> we could just maybe arm wrestle instead. <laughs> any good as brothers? Any good uh, Any good fights growing up? Man, we used to beat the crap out of each other. I mean, like every – and we were so evenly matched that our parents would go to work, and we would have these fights till exhaustion. They'd last like eight hours in some cases. And – uh then something happened like when we, I don't know, right around 15 or 16, we just stopped one day and never had another fight. Hmm? Ty, when you started lifting weights, I think that's when we stopped fighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you ever throw a bowl of spaghetti on your brother? Because Brock did that right on a Friday night as I was walking out the door to go out. No, never spaghetti. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure I've thrown a bunch of rocks at him. <laughs> but you, you, came back, you came back from your year of space and you were you were taller than your twin brother, right? It would have been, I, I would have th thought, you know, if I could have had that as a teenager, I think I would have gone to space to get a couple inches on my brother. Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, you stretch in space, your spine elongates. You probably stretch when you're sleeping at night too in bed. I probably, if you, when you wake up in the morning, if you measure yourself, you'd probably be an inch taller but if you, before you went get out of bed. But, um, uh, yeah, as soon as I got back and saw my brother, the first thing he said to me is, uh, he goes, uh, yeah, he's calling me right now, by the way. Um, he uh, he says, uh, hey, turn around. And we turned back to back. He goes, okay, just checking. Make sure we're <laughs> the same height still. So that was not true. So you did not grow two inches in, when, you, uh, when you were up there. I stretched an inch and a half. Okay. And then I immediately squished back as soon as i got back to earth i squished back down to my normal six huh. foot four <laughs> well, i'm glad we uh, corrected the record here on the climate pod yeah i've tried to correct that record many <laughs> times it doesn't matter what do they well, say about what do they say about a a lyle you know Lyle get around the world before the uh, truth gets their pants on or something <laughs> <laughs> Well, in both Goodnight Astronaut and the audio course that you released uh, on Knowable last year, you, know, you talk a lot about you know, how to dream and how to lead and how to achieve things that really might seem impossible. And we talked to so many young activists and, and movement veterans, really, uh, in this climate fight. Do you have any leadership advice for these people uh, to, to help them really take on the challenge and some of these just gigantic institutions that are fighting, that are pushing back on climate progress? Um, well, certainly, you know, you never want to give up and, uh, you know, incremental steps and achievements, uh, you know, all put together can add up to some pretty great things and, um, you know, partner with the right people, you know, find advocates and, you know, smart people to work with. And, you know, it's going to be a tough fight, but I'm, I'm optimistic that at some point we'll get our, get our arms around this problem. 
Oh, you mentioned earlier that there were books that inspired you. Any other, any children's book that you were really into, whether it was growing up or, or reading to your kids? Uh, I didn't really read much as a kid. Um, it wasn't my thing. Um, but certainly, you know, Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff. The book Endurance by uh, Alfred Lansing about Shackleton's, uh, you know, Antarctic uh, expedition that was is really an incredible story of survival. I, I took that book with me in space because I always felt like if anything ever got, you know, the situation got really bad and was challenging, uncomfortable, difficult, I could always up, open up the pages of that book and I feel a whole lot better about my situation. Um, but uh, yeah, those are were the two books that were really important to me. Um, you know, I read now, but I uh, wasn't a big reader as a kid. I know, obviously, we're, we're in quarantine now, so we're not going anywhere. But when you're out in the world and you're giving speeches and you're moving around, do, do, do kids often ask you what it's like to be an astronaut? Um, yeah, that's a pretty common one. What do you tell them? Um, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and I, I also tell them, hey, you know, if I can do this, it's an indicator that anyone can. So just don't give up on your dreams. Well, you've written a really cool book, another really cool book. So again, the book is Good Night Astronaut. And again, it's, you have so many, so many cool stories. It's such a cool, cool illustrations in the book. And I really think a lot of parents are going to get a kick out of it. And man, what a great time to be helping parents out, getting kids to sleep. I mean, what a great book for now. So Commander Scott Kelly, thank you again for joining the Clamp Pod. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, appreciate coming on your your uh, podcast and getting to talk about my new book. Thanks.